Welcome to Crosswords, the podcast about practical Christianity. What does it look like to walk in Jesus' footsteps? How do I live in a culture hostile to godliness? These are questions that we'll answer on each podcast as we get our heart and mind on Jesus. All scriptures quoted are from the New International Version. You can follow me on Twitter at Kingdom underscore Saint. Walk with the Lord today and be a blessing. Good afternoon, brothers and sisters. Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers and mothers-to-be among us, whether in person or virtual. I hope you're having a good Mother's Day, and I hope you had a good first reading of the first half of the book of Isaiah. You know, Isaiah is the most quoted prophet in the New Testament. He wrote the longest prophetic book, and he stands first in the list of the prophets. He prophesied around the same time uh, as Amos, Hosea, Joel, and Micah. And there are just so many amazing messianic prophecies in this book, so much so that it's often referred to as the fifth gospel. Up until 1947, many critics of the Bible, in particular critics of Isaiah's prophecies, because they contain the most messianic prophecies, they thought manuscript writers had just simply written these prophecies after the fact, because they were such, such, such perfect prophecies, so pointed, that they thought surely, you know, these were written after all these things happened, because how else could we explain this? So there were a lot of critics and there was a lot of doubt that was risen up, but in 1947, an amazing archaeological discovery took place. We called it the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, Discovery. And what they discovered were original manuscripts of many of the Old Testament books, including the book of Isaiah. And the amazing thing of this is that they were all dated to be around 200 BC, 200 years before Jesus fulfilled all these prophecies and before the kingdom prophecies were fulfilled as well. So that was well beyond the scope of the fulfilled prophecies of the Messiah. So scrolls of Isaiah were found in these caves in, uh, near the Dead Sea, that's why they're called the Dead Sea Scrolls, in a place called Qumran, and they were confirmed to belong to the Essenes who hid these literary treasures in jars, just like you see in the presentation. So they were very, very well preserved. Not all of them, but most of them were. Uh, and they hid them, they believed to be during the Roman conquest of Judea, which occurred around 200 BC. So the scholars examined uh, these uh, scrolls and they determined that the text of Isaiah found in the Dead Sea Scrolls were no different than the text of Isaiah that we have today, that were translated from the Masoretic text. You see, because before this time, the oldest uh, Hebrew document that we had uh, belonged to the Masoretic text of 900 AD. So that's 900 years after Jesus Christ. So many thought, yeah, well, maybe this has been rewritten or maybe things have changed. But then the Dead Sea Scrolls come along, dated to 200 BC. And upon comparison, they were exactly the same. Nothing had changed. Isaiah contained the exact same message, the exact same prophecies, and provided proof texts from divine origin and not a fabrication of mankind as some thought. So the critics have been silenced ever since. This and many other archeological discoveries continue to provide solid proof that the Bible is unique, that it is not man-made, it doesn't come from the mind of man, it is a divine source, and its voice continues to speak to people today and still as relevant today in this century as it was millennia ago, as we will hear Isaiah's prophet, Isaiah's message uh, to our first or to our 21st century today. So Isaiah opens up with a scathing indictment against the assemblies of God's people in Jerusalem. He'll say here, the multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me, says the Lord? I have more than enough burnt offerings of rams and of fat of the fattened animals. 
I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. When you come to appear before me, who has asked you of this, this trampling in my courts? Stop bringing me meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moon, Sabbaths, convocations. I cannot bear your worthless assemblies. Your new moon feast and your appointed festivals, I hate with all my being. They have become a burden to me. I'm weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my eyes from you. Even when you offer many prayers, I'm not listening. Your hands are full of blood. This is a scathing indictment, isn't it? I mean, think about God feeling this way about your service, about your worship. Notice what he describes here. He says, stop this trampling in my courts, meaning that they showed no, no dignity or respect before God. They just came before him in his temple with blood on their hands, God says at the end of this verse here, at the end of this passage. That means they were hypocritical. And everything that they offered, God says here, was meaningless. Meaningless assemblies, meaningless, meaningless sacrifices, because they had blood on their hands. That means they were full of violence. They were full of hate. They were full of murder in their hearts. God could not bear what they did, not even their prayers, because of, excuse me, of their hypocrisy. You know, God doesn't care about what or how you do it more than he cares about the why. This is what Isaiah emphasizes. The why also is not to be dictated by you. The why, if it's dictated by you, why you do it, then it becomes idolatry. The why needs to be all throughout the message of Isaiah because we fear the Lord, because we want to seek him with all our heart. That should be the why. We seek to want to derive our identity from him and not from the world. And that's the big contrast highlighted here throughout the message of Isaiah. Instead of being pleasing to God, instead of wanting to do things to please the Lord, he detested everything they did because they just wanted to be like everybody else and wanted to be hypocrites like everyone else. I ask you today, my brothers and sisters, because this is a message directed to the people of God. Are your hands full of blood? That's the question I'm going to ask you today on this Mother's Day of all day. <laughs> are your hands full of blood? And how do we know if they are? Well, simply, Leviticus 19, verses 17 through 18 teaches us, don't hate a fellow Israelite in your heart. Rebuke your neighbor frankly so you won't share in their guilt. But don't seek revenge. Don't bear a grudge against anyone among your people. But love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. He always adds that I am the Lord to emphasize. This is who I am. I'm about love. I'm not about revenge. I'm not about bearing grudges. Similarly, John echoes this message in the New Testament saying anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer. Are your hands full of blood? Do you harbor hate? Do you harbor bias? Prejudice? Do you hold grudges if you do? You've got blood on your hands. What are you going to do about it? Isaiah will say here in chapter 2, verse 6 through 9. This is Isaiah now talking to God, saying, Lord, you have abandoned your people, the descendants of Jacob. And this is what Isaiah observed. Notice what he observed. You are, they are full of superstitions from the East. They practice divination like the Philistines. They embrace pagan customs. Their land is full of silver and gold. There's no end to their treasuries. Their land is full of horses. There's no end to their chariots. Their land is full of idols. They bow down to the work of their hands, to what their fingers have made. So people will be brought low and everyone humble. Don't forgive them. This is what Isaiah is saying to God. And notice how he describes, he describes a land full of stuff. Doesn't he say it? He says they're, they're full of superstitions. They're full of silver and gold, full of horses, full of idols. It was a full land, yet... Where it mattered, they were completely empty, full of superstitions. This is what happens when you don't seek God out. 
If you don't worship God and you don't seek to please him, you're going to start worshiping everything else under the sun. And that's what Isaiah is pointing out here. They were full of superstitions, psychics, horoscopes. I mean, you see that today, don't you? It's like he's preaching to this generation. Full of old wives' tales and traditions and customs that Jesus himself says invalidate the word of God. Furthermore, Isaiah will say here in chapter 8, verse 12, he adds, don't call conspiracy everything these people call conspiracy. Oh, how applicable is that today? So many conspiracies floating around from both sides, right? Is that what you're into? Is that what you're buying? Because if you do, you're just full of something that's not God. You're empty of God. Don't fear what they fear. See, conspiracies lead to fear. Not the fear of the Lord, but to get rid of this conspiracy means that you're fearing the Lord. And so I want to give you a small little micro lesson here about how not to fall for conspiracies, how to identify propaganda in this day and age. And you're not going to learn this in college. You're not going to learn this in high school. OK, they don't teach you about this. There are three ways that you can identify propaganda at any given time. And number one is People basically saying that you're bringing up non-evidence-based arguments. Basically, if someone accuses you of being a conspiracy theorist, which is one of the oldest and most effective means of silencing you, <laughs> and this, by the way, is a catchphrase that was invented by the CIA back in 1967. And when people say stuff like that, they're trying to discredit the veracity of something that is being sold to you. Another form of propaganda comes in the way of what's called microaggression, which are subtle expressions of bigotry or prejudice, sometimes used with a euphemism. Like if, if I can't get something, let's say, you know, I'm a 50 year old guy. I don't think I'm old, right? You know, 50 is, is okay, right? And, and I can't work some new technology and somebody comes and says, hey, hey, grandpa, let me show you how that works. <laughs> now, some of you might say it in jest, and sometimes you might kid with each other, but that's an example of a microaggression aimed at causing somebody to feel a particular way. You can register your daughter at the front desk. Now, you might think that that phrase doesn't sound microaggressive, but that's what I heard when Clary and I went to register Enoch at school, and they mistook Clary for my daughter. So that was a microaggression. <laughs> I mean, I wasn't bothered by it. <laughs> But that was a subtle way to say, hey, old man, you know, uh, register your daughter over here. But there are some other expressions that might not be so nice. Oh, you're an anti-vaxxer. That's a common one you hear today, right? Or what's the other side of that coin? Oh, well, you're just submitting yourself to an experiment. That's why you're getting the vaccine. You're submitting yourself to an experiment. That's from the other side. So both sides try to use these subtle expressions of prejudice to make you feel a certain way. And what happens is that when you do that, you kind of stop any kind of intelligent conversation that you can have with somebody about the view from the other side. And so that becomes sort of your tagline. If that becomes your tagline instead of the banner over me is the love of Jesus Christ, then you can see how you can become so full of something and yet stand for nothing in God's eyes. Because you're about spreading either, oh, I'm vaccinated, and if you're not vaccinated, you're an anti-vaxxer, or you're a Trump supporter. Or I could say the other line, but now I'm not being known by being a Christian, but I'm being known by uh, promoting some kind of propaganda, because it's propaganda, whichever side it's coming from. And so I'm bringing this up to let you know, do you have blood on your hands because you're engaging in this type of thing? Because if you do, and you don't stop, you got blood on your hands. I want you to understand that, especially the young people among us. The kingdom of God is not about getting vaccinated or not getting vaccinated. The kingdom of God is not about Republicans or Democrats. It's not about whether I use a mask or decide not to use a mask. The kingdom of God is about peace, love, and the Holy Spirit. And you better get that into your heads or God is gonna hate what you offer him. They were full of stuff, but they were not full of God. 
full of silver and gold, meaning riches was their goal. Yet they were not satisfied. And this turned them against each other because it brought greed into their hearts. Full of horses, indicating that they were a materialistic society. They focused on what made them feel powerful. Looking at their bank accounts would be a translation for us today. Looking at our garage, oh, I have one car, I have two, I'm okay. Looking at our houses, how big of acreage I have, how many rooms I have, I'm okay. They were full of idols. And when you reject God, like I said before, you're going to accept anything else. Anything else is going to become your standard. Anything else is going to become what you try to get to. And you're going to find yourself becoming more and more empty, more and more dissatisfied. This was their state. He is talking to us, isn't he? In this 21st century, we're still plagued by the same issues. 2,000 years later, <laughs> 3,000 years later. So he says, you need to change. God wants us to change. He wants to radicalize our worship. He doesn't want us to bring him a ho-hum worship. He doesn't want this to become a tradition. He doesn't want this to become a ritual because this is a relationship we have with God. And he was missing out on that from his people back then. That's why he was so passionate about these things that he's saying. And we have to become as passionate today if we want to understand why God was feeling that way. So that we don't become those people. And if we are, if we're looking in the mirror and saying, well, you know, I'm, I gotta be careful because I'm just like that. Or I have said these things. I've used microaggression. I've tried to make other people feel a certain way because they don't agree with my opinions. I know we've all done it. Don't be a hypocrite. Admit it and change. Say, I don't wanna be like that because that's just the mirror of the world around me and I'm better than that. God wants me to be better than that. God wants a relationship with us, not an association. His people back then thought that, oh yeah, we can do anything we want as long as we got the temple and we offer our sacrifices, we'll do anything else because we got God, you know, hey, look, the temple's right here. So they thought that a mere association with God would protect them. How wrong were they? That's what God sought them to, <laughs> that's what God sought to tell them throughout the prophets, says, you're wrong. This is not who I am. I'm not a God of hypocrisy. That's like getting married and expecting your spouse to be okay with you being intimate with other people on occasion. How would that fly by your spouse? And if any atheist or non-religious person understands that example, then we can certainly understand it. Because this is about faithfulness to God. But our society has trouble showing that with each other, don't they? <laughs> so we have to be very careful. If we just try to maintain the look or the form of marriage, if we're just married on paper and we wear our rings to show we're married, but our marriage is in shambles because we're hypocrites, change. Look at yourself and make the change because God already sees it. And if that's how your marriage is, and you come here, and you pray, and you take the Lord's Supper, you've got blood on your hands. And God says, I hate your singing. I'm not even listening to your prayers, because you're a hypocrite. Change your home. Change your relationship with your spouse, with your children. God's not kidding. Don't forget about him. The Jews tried to maintain that look and that form, but like we read in Isaiah 29, 13, their hearts were far from him. This is the scripture Jesus brings up to the Pharisees, doesn't it? And so he says here in Isaiah 1, 16 through 20, wash and make yourselves clean. This is God appealing to them, appealing to us right now in the 21st. Wash and make yourselves clean. Take the evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Very simple. And here's what God wants us to do. Seek justice. Do the right thing. 
Defend the oppressed. You know, God's very concerned about the disenfranchised. This is what I find all throughout the prophets. He's concerned about the guy who's begging on the corner. He's concerned about the orphan. He's concerned about the widow. He's concerned about the people that can't stand up for themselves. And yet, here I am counting how much money I have in my account, painting my walls, making sure my car is bright and shiny. What's wrong with that picture? God wants me to be concerned for the disenfranchised in my community. Am I looking for them? Am I helping them in some way or another? That's a challenge, isn't it? Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. And I love how he says it here in verse 18. Come now. Let us reason together. This is our God. He wants to reason with you. God doesn't want to force you into doing anything because you're going to decide to do whatever you're going to decide to do. But God says, come on, man, let's reason here. I'm here for you. I want to clean you. I want to save you. I want to give you joy. But you keep running after other gods. Who's unreasonable? <laughs> Who's unreasonable? He says, though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they're red as crimson, they shall be like wool. If you're willing and obedient, you will eat the good of the land. But if you resist and rebel, you're going to be devoured by the sword. Because what you look for and what you admire is going to oppress you and it's going to become your chains. That is just truth. And we've seen it over and over again throughout all the generations. People become enslaved by what they seek. But if you seek the Lord, he won't enslave you. He will save you. He will free you. Matter of fact, the only real freedom comes from God. Anyone else is really a slave to their sins, as Jesus said. So the only way to come near God is not by ritualistic performance, but by purifying our minds from evil. James says it, James 4, 8 through 9, he says, come near to God. He'll come near to you. But you got to wash your hands, you sinners. You got to purify your hearts, you hypocrites. He says it like it is. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Learn to grieve about your sin. Learn to say, man, I was wrong. I don't want to be like that. Be honest. And I grant you, it took me a while to get that honest. Because honestly, when I was a young Christian, I thought, oh, that's not that bad what I did. <laughs> I'll try to do better, but... It's not that bad, you know, it's not like I killed anybody. <laughs> but when God says, oh, if you hate, it's just like you killed somebody. But that took a while for it to cement in my heart. I get it. You know, some, of, some of our minds and hearts are so, are so sarcastic and, and so darkened that it's going to take us some time. But don't give up. You know God is right. And you know you are wrong. That's what you need to be convinced of. So you can keep walking in the right direction. You know, we can come and assemble before the Lord in meaningful worship when individually our hearts are right before the Lord because we want to do what's right. Not because I feel like I want to necessarily, but because I fear God and I want to learn to do what's right. I don't know how to do it. I'll be honest with you. And I'll be honest with you, I don't want to do it. I'd rather stay home and watch TV and shine my car and clip my grass. Because it's a lot easier. But I know that's not what God likes. So I have to force myself to look for the disenfranchised. To help those. But that's what it is to be faithful to God. Right, husbands? I mean, we don't feel like every day we ought to cook for our wives. We do it maybe once a year for Mother's Day. What about the rest of the days? She's not worthy enough the other days? <laughs> And so we become hypocrites because of a tradition that we have in this country. And we feel good. Oh, yeah, I'm a good husband. I cook for my wife today. Well, what happened to the other 364 days? And so you see how idolatry begins. Be careful. Jesus tells us here, don't hold grudges. He says, if you're offering a gift at the altar and remember that your brother or sister has something against you, Leave it right there. Don't come. Leave church. Bye-bye. Go. Don't want you here. First, go and be reconciled. You know you've got some, 
do you know you, you, if you know somebody has something against you somewhere, or even if you just doubt it, you're not sure. And I appreciate because some of you even have called me and says, Pedro, I just want to make sure that I didn't say something that offended you. And I always say the same thing. I said, you know, it's really, really hard to offend me because I know who I am. I know what I am. So if you offended me, maybe I deserved it. If you insulted me, maybe I deserved it. Okay, so you're fine. Don't worry about me. I'm the one who has to check on if I offended you. And I appreciate when you do that. Because you're practicing this very passage. You want to make sure that you're clean when you come before God. Because it's about God, not about you. You've got your priorities straight. What about this one, being controversial? Oh yeah, a lot of people in our generation like to be controversial. I can understand that because I, I was a controversial kid. You know, I like to cause controversy back in the day. I like to sow a little... Uh, uh, division amongst people and see them fight each other off. You know, I took pleasure in that. Uh, somebody did something bad to me, I would go around the back without them noticing and do something so that I would cause some controversy for them somehow. That was me. Very insidious, like evil. <laughs> but Titus here gives us, you know, he gives it to us. Paul gives it to Titus. Avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, and arguments and quarrels about the law. And not just about the law, about anything. Because they're unprofitable, useless. Warn a divisive person once, then warn them a second time. After that, have nothing to do with them. God is not happy with people who sow division. That's completely against His will. He says here in verse 11, These people are warped and sinful. They're self-condemned have nothing to do with people who try to get you wrapped up in controversies or divisions or quarrels. Tell them right there, stop, I'm not interested. Don't be an advocate just by staying silent. Tell them to stop. He says, stop them, warn them. <laughs> God doesn't like this. Are you, one, are you a person like this? I got to confess to you, when I was a, a brand new Christian, that, that kind of stuff was in my heart. And I had to convince myself that this wasn't a good thing. <laughs> but it took some time. And so if you understand that that is sin, understand that is something God doesn't like about you. That needs to go. Because it also is preventing your growth as a person. You ever seen a sarcastic, controversial old man? Yeah, they're alone and they'll die alone because nobody else wants to be with them. And thirdly, being a stumbling block. Paul talks about this in Romans 14, the whole entire chapter. It's about causing people to stumble, but I'll just focus on verse 20 through 22. Sorry, I only have 21 through 22 up, up there. He starts out by saying in verse 20, don't destroy the work of God for the sake of food. But you can add anything there. Don't destroy the work of God for the sake of vaccination. Don't destroy the work of God for the sake of the environment. Don't destroy the work of God for the sake of politics. You can add there whatever you want. Whatever opinion. It's not about the work of God. Don't talk about it or talk about it with people who are mature enough to talk about it. One of the things that I really enjoy about the mentorship group that I'm in is we talk about all these things. And we all have different opinions about them. But we talk about them. And we make good conversation. And we learn from each other. We haven't convinced each other <laughs> to, to change our opinion. But we can talk about it without offending each other, without calling each other names. Isn't that what the kingdom of God is about? How come we can't do that in a bigger group, I, I ask you? How come I can't? I know why. I just told you why. Hypocrisy. You're more scared of what people think than about the truth of God. That's why. You can't talk about it with me. You're not self-confident enough. Because your confidence is still based on people or on you instead of God. So you need to change that. I'd love to have an intelligent conversation with you if you're not scared enough to have it. But it's going to always center around God. And it's always going to be convicting. Maybe that's what scares some people. Huh? 
He says, don't destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All food is clean, but, if, but it is wrong for a person to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. So if I think eating meat is great, and I love eating meat, I love a good steak, but what I think is good can become wrong if it causes somebody else to stumble. If I'm all for vaccines and I got my vaccines and I, and I think vaccines save lives, but if you don't want the vaccine or if you can't get it, and I said, well, you're an anti-vaxxer, now all of a sudden my opinion becomes wrong in the eyes of God. And that's the eyes that count. See, before I forced my opinion on you, it was neither right nor wrong. But when I try to force it on you, it becomes wrong. No matter what the opinion is. Do you understand that? Say amen if you do. I hope you do. Because this is crucial for you not to become a stumbling block to any brother or sister here in the church. And so not have blood on your hands. Because God takes these things very seriously. As you see here. So he ends here in verse 20. He says, whatever you believe about these things, a hundred years from now is not going to matter. So keep it to yourself, okay? Keep it between yourself and God. And then he adds this. I love this line. Blessed is the one who doesn't have to condemn himself by what he approves. Because I keep it for myself and God. And if I can talk it with somebody that I think I can talk it about, we talk about it. If I know that I can't talk about it with somebody else, I don't talk about it. And I'm good. My opinions then don't become wrong because I cause somebody to stumble. You get that? It's not that hard to get. God is interested in reasoning with us. He doesn't demand things from us. He wants to reason with us so that we can yield and make ourselves clean. So how do we do that? How do we wash? How do we make ourselves clean? How do we purify our hearts as God says, wash your hands, purify your hearts as James calls us to do? What do we do? Well, if you're not a Christian and God's words have convicted you, if what, I'm, if what I've said to you today makes sense and you've been wondering about it, and it's convicting you. It's causing you to think about these things, helping you realize, you know, yeah, I need to become a better person. I don't want to become like the rest of these people or caught up in hypocrisy and therefore don't know how to have intimate relationships because they're more afraid of what people think than about God. I get that. I don't like where this sin is leading me. If that's what you are thinking, there is a simple solution for your problem, thanks to Jesus Christ. As you heard our brother talk about here this morning, that's precisely why Jesus came, to free us from all these silly things that we get caught up in. To free us, to give us a direction so that we can really experience freedom. You've probably heard that Jesus' blood washes our sin, and maybe you've wondered what that means. And, and how does that work? God says he'll make our sins as white as snow. He will cleanse us. And in this century, here in 2021, that happens in a very particular way, and I'm going to get to it shortly. But let's begin by talking about how Jesus fulfilled all of Isaiah's prophecies. There are so many of them, too many for me to mention now, so I'm just going to mention two. One that focuses on Jesus as the Messiah, and the other one on Jesus' kingdom, the church. Uh, so let's look at that in Isaiah 9, 6, one of my favorite passages from Isaiah. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, and of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. Wow, sounds great. I want that guy to run for president, whoever it is he's talking about here. Uh, it reminds me of the discussion that we had uh, for uh, our Bible class, right? Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. Think about that hope. Like our brother mentioned, that experiment that Mark was talking about, you know, that kept those rats swimming away uh, for 60 hours. Man, you know, what keeps us walking through this earth in spite of all that, this kind of hope that Isaiah 
is giving us. And he preached about this back in 700 BC. And yet that gave so much hope to the Jews that they endured an Assyrian captivity, a Babylonian captivity, and all these other things, waiting to hear from this blessed Messiah until the time that this was fulfilled. This, this child, the, the son of man. I like how some people have made Isaiah's words into this little tree here for, for Christmas. I like how that looks. This son of man, as Jesus called himself, this wonderful counselor, this mighty God, this everlasting father. He was born 2000 years ago. And we live in a special time to be able to look back and say, wow, this really happened. And look how all these prophecies were fulfilled. This is miraculous. Nothing like this has ever been written. Nothing like this has happened in history. And so we are very blessed to be able to reason as God wants us to do, to use our brain, right? More for than just holding up our hat or our hair. And to say, wow, this is true. This is real. God's not kidding around. He did send his Messiah to provide a purification unlike any other his people had known at that time. And one that would also establish, a Messiah that would also establish a kingdom that would rule forever. Who has ever heard of that? And of course, just like the Jews thought that this Messiah would actually be a physical kingdom with physical soldiers and chariots and, and castles and stuff, they completely misread it. Of course, they didn't understand it. Nobody did, not even the angels, Peter says. But now that Jesus has come and has established his kingdom, and we know we're a part of it, as Isaiah says here in Isaiah 2, 2 through 5, in the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills, and all nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob, he will teach us his way so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Come, descendants of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. This prophecy here, and all of us who, who've taught the coming of the kingdom study to other people, we know that this prophecy speaks of the church, of when the church was established. And we can go line by line. I don't have time to do that now in this sermon. We can go line by line and explain how each of those was fulfilled in Acts chapter 2 to the letter to the point. It's a beautiful thing to study and observe how the Messiah ushered this, pro this possibility of this kingdom without borders, without language, but with one spirit to become united and to outlast any other nation until the day Jesus comes back. That is divine action. That is divine origin. That is what the Messiah has brought for us today. So this verse and the one we read in chapter 9, verse 6, they're both working together to speak of the promises that have been fulfilled in Christ and in the kingdom of God, his church. And as this verse says here, we all need to go up to this mountain of the Lord. And mountain, by the way, is Bible speak for kingdom or for a nation or a city. We all need to go to the kingdom of God, to the church, to learn his ways, to learn to walk in his paths. You're not going to learn that anywhere else, but in God's kingdom. So we want to become part of those people. We want to become part of those nations that want to stream to this kingdom, part of a peoples that want to take weapons of war and, and lay them down and pick up instead spiritual weapons, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10, weapons that have divine strength to defeat the strongholds in our minds and in our heart, to destroy those barriers of prejudice and oppression and bullying, which dominates the world, so that the kingdom of God can be a bright place. And so that when people come here and say, wow, this is different. And we've heard people say that, right? For all glory to the Lord. Because that's what we seek to practice here. God's way of doing things. But in order for that to happen, we've got to shed a lot of that world that tries to stick on us. <laughs> Just like when you walk through the forest and you get all kinds of briars and stuff stuck on your clothes. Well, sometimes when we walk through the world, we get a lot of other stuff stuck on us. And thank God that the cleansing that he provides 
is a powerful cleansing that continues on and on and on. So we don't need to be concerned about that. So we have to be those people like Isaiah that said, here I am, send me. As he says in Isaiah 6, 8. Because God is looking for those volunteers to go out and spread his message. You see, Isaiah is not just about the Messiah and the fulfillment of the kingdom, but Isaiah is an incredibly evangelistic book because it all centers around Isaiah spreading this message and God kind of asking him, you know, uh, this question, hmm, whom should I send? Who, who shall go for us and talk about these things? And everybody's like, oh, not me, I don't know. <laughs> but we have to be like Isaiah and boldly say, here I am, Lord, send me. I'll volunteer to go and speak to these hard-headed people. I'll volunteer and go to speak with these idolatrous people. I'll be one of these people who try to preach your truth amidst all this knowledge and stuff that's vain to see if there is somebody that might turn to you. So that's what it's about, turning to God and the way, like I said before, I'm going to share with you how that cleansing is provided nowadays. We turn to God. So when we turn to God, what do we do? We turn away from the world. You can't turn to, you can't walk in opposite uh, ways at the same time. It's impossible. So when you're turning from something, when you realize, yeah, I don't want to be like this. I want to have hope. I want to be a better person. I want to be a person that glorifies God. That involves a turning around. That's what we call repentance. And we turn to God. That means turning away from your opinions also. Because partly of what keeps you trapped is your own opinion, your own small worldview of viewing things. You can't see things better than God can. So you have to lay those aside also and turn to God to trust Him. Trust His Word. It might not make sense to you at first. It might be even opposed to some of your opinions at first. But you trust Him. Just like you young people learn to trust your mom and dad because you know they love you. You learn to trust God Almighty who made you and who also loves you. Even though some things might not seem right to you or something might seem different it's about trusting God and if you embrace that you should be immediately convicted that anything outside of Christ or God becomes a fabrication it doesn't last long there's only truth grace and love in Christ outside of Christ there's judgment there's emptiness there is hatred so if you want to learn his ways you learn to accept this gospel that we show here every Sunday. The fact that God uh, sent Jesus to die on a cross to provide that purification for us. He was buried and he was raised on the third day again to show us that God is serious, that God is behind this. No man is behind this. Man is not smart enough to make a plan like this. But God has been making this plan since the beginning. And the amazing thing is that it is as applicable today as it was any other century before. So how do we make this my gospel? How do I let this cleanse me? Well, in Colossians chapter 2, verse 11 and 12, Paul says, In him, the Holy Spirit says through Paul, In him, in Jesus, you were circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. See, this is something that God is doing. So when, when does that happen? He says here, your whole flesh ruled by, uh, your whole self ruled by the flesh was put off when you were circumcised by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you're also raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. So when I surrender myself to Jesus in baptism, that's what those wavy blue lines mean, that I'm now burying, being buried with Christ, dying with Christ, because I recognize I want to become a better person, and I can't do it on my own. I can't will it to happen, but I have to surrender to God. I die. It says here in Colossians, Jesus cuts off the part of me that is bad. The self ruled by the flesh. He cuts it off. He does that. It's an operation done by him. I can't do that to me. He does it. And it happens when I'm buried with him. So when I come out of the watery grave of baptism, I'm walking as a new person with all that burden of evil, uh, free from that, free from the control of that. Paul puts it in a different way in Romans chapter 6. Verse 3 and 4, he'll say, Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him in baptism, through, through a baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, we too may live a new life. 
So new life can begin right now. It doesn't begin when you die. <laughs> it can begin right now. Right now you can begin your eternal life by embracing Christ and taking this first step of dying with him so that you can be brought out to start walking in newness of life. So I hope this is the message of Isaiah. This is Isaiah part one. Next week we'll do Isaiah part two because it's a long book. And I hope that Isaiah's message, I hope that you've let it into your heart because it's just as applicable to us today as it was when he preached it in 750 BC. God bless you. Have a great afternoon. Have a happy Mother's Day to all you mothers. We love you very much. Thank you very much for listening. I hope the Lord gave you insight into conforming to Jesus with today's message. I always appreciate feedback. You can send me your thoughts, musings, and comments directly through the Anchor app. You can also contact me on Twitter at Kingdom underscore Saint. Walk with the Lord today and be a blessing.